So when solving this, a lot of us just look at it and we say, oh, the answer must be 5. I got that one. That's easy. But if you just got an answer of 5, it's not entirely right. Because if I have x squared equals 25, really what I'm doing to both sides is I'm taking the square root of both sides of that equation. So I'm taking the square root of the x squared. I'm taking the square root of the 25. And that's what tends to make us think that the answer is only that x equals 5. But it's not. The reason why it leads us into thinking that is because when we do square root of 25, we only get one number. But 5 is not the only number I can square that gives me 25. What other number squared would equal 25? What about negative 5? Negative 5 squared would also equal 25, because a negative 5 squared means a negative 5 times a negative 5, and a negative times a negative is a positive. So, how do we account for that in our work? Well, we actually insert this little plus or minus symbol. The plus or minus symbol, it's a plus over a minus, it means both the plus and the minus versions of that number. And so when I wrote over here x equals 5 comma negative 5, it's equaling both of those. That's the exact same thing as writing x equals plus or minus 5. Those two statements mean the exact same thing. And so this is basically what we're seeing today is somewhat newish. Is that when we solve a quadratic like this, we're going to end up with two different solutions. Now a little side note here. Imagine you're graphing x squared. So that's what our graph of x squared might look like. And if you're going to see when does x squared equals 25, that would be when does it reach a height of 25. Notice it would cross our graph twice. So again, a graphical way of seeing that there really needs to be two different solutions to this. At least when it's up there. Of course, there are other scenarios. It's possible there will only be one solution, that's if it crosses only at the vertex, or it's even possible when solving these you get no solutions. That's when we miss the graph entirely. So just some stuff we're looking forward to. All right, we're now going to be solving these two equations. So go ahead and write down both. And if you're feeling confident, go ahead and start solving them out, but be ready, leave in some room to make a couple little corrections if need be. All right, so like for that first one, the first thing you need to do is get the squared part by itself. So that means I need to move the 16 over first. So step one, add 16 to both sides. That gives us x squared equals 81. From here, it looks like the first one, right? So we do what we did there. We take the square root of both sides. So square root of x squared equals, now this is the tricky part, when I do the square root of 81, when I introduce that square root, that's where I write that plus or minus for the first time. It happens when we introduce the square root, because technically that square root symbol means the positive number that multiplied by itself would give you whatever's inside. Well, we want both the positive and the negative version. All right, so on the left side, square root of x squared is just x. That's the point of taking the square root. It cancels out x squared. And then that equals a plus or minus 9. Now that would be fine as your final answer, but if you want to make it a little clearer, you can write it as x equals 9 comma negative 9. All right, now for the second problem. I again need the squared part by itself first. I don't want to start by taking the square root of both sides. It would get messy, it would get ugly, bad things happen. So I'm instead going to start by dividing both sides by 5. <coughs> When we do that, we get 4 equals x squared. And then, of course, we now take the square root of both sides. And when I take the square root of both sides, remember what you need to remember? Plus or minus. Goes right in front of the number. All right. Or more specifically, right in front of the square root of the number. It needs to be outside the square root. 
So that gives me the plus or minus 2 equals x, or in other words, x equals 2 and negative 2. <coughs> Alright, now for this first one here, you notice that the x plus 5 is all inside the parentheses, so I cannot do anything with the 5 right now. It's trapped inside the parentheses. So I actually need to start by dealing with the squared. So I'm going to do the plus or minus square root of 9 equals the square root of the x plus 5 squared. Now on the left side, that would give me plus or minus 3, and on the right side, the square root is canceling out the squared. So whatever was being squared is now left exactly as it was, in this case x plus 5. Now there's one little problem with that plus or minus notation is our next operation that we need to do in order to solve this is we need to subtract 5 from both sides. But how do you do plus or minus 3 minus 5? It, it, it's kind of weird and ugly to look at, right? And while some of you would be perfectly comfortable working with it that way, we can actually make our lives a little bit smoother and a little bit more reliable if we now split this into two equations. I'm going to write this once as 3 equals x plus 5, and I'm going to also write it as negative 3 equals x plus 5. Notice it's the exact same thing as the plus or minus 3, just now I've written it as two separate equations, which means that now when I say 3 minus 5, that makes sense, and negative 3 minus 5, that makes sense. And so the 3 minus 5 gives me 2 negative, and the negative 3 minus 5 gives me negative 8, so x equals negative 2 and negative 8, which you can write as two separate statements like you see it there, or you can summarize it at the end as x equals negative 2 comma negative 8. Uh, uh, one little side note on that, where we write the two numbers with a comma between them, notice there's no parentheses around that. We don't want parentheses around that because these are both x values. If you put parentheses around it, you're saying it's an ordered pair. It's x and y. But it's not x and y. They're both x's. So definitely no parentheses there. All right, so having seen that one, I think you can go ahead and do the next one over. So go ahead and do that second problem. So with the 7 not being in parentheses, I do want to move it to the other side first, so I first start by adding 7 and adding 7. Now at this point we can go ahead and take the square root of both sides. Now, since I ended up with that plus or minus 4, but I still have to operate on it, I still have to add 8 to it, that's what tells me I'm now going to split it into two separate equations for actually doing that work. So I'm going to do one where it's eight, x minus 8 equals 4, and the other x minus 8 equals negative 4. And I know to do that because I still have to operate on that number. All right, so now we go ahead and we add 8 to both sides. And I can actually do that on both equations. So you should find here that x equals 12 and 4. All right, I think you got the basic idea down. So go ahead and solve both of these to make sure you got the whole process. And there is also our second answer. So check both of those. Make sure that you're heading on the right track with them. Make any corrections as necessary.
the big thing to focus on as you solve this first one is remembering what our first goal is. And our first goal is to get the squared part by itself. So basically I'm trying to get rid of the 7 and get rid of the 29. And always get rid of the addition and subtraction first of those. And then once we've gotten that squared part by itself, that's where we go ahead and take the square root of both sides. And since I'm going to have to actually operate on that plus or minus 3, I'm going to write it as two separate equations. And you should get x equals negative 6 and negative 12. Now for the second equation, it looks really simple, right? All we got to do is add 4 to both sides. And yes, we have to add the 4 before we take the square root. Uh, the square root on that left side, if you try to take it of the whole x squared minus 4, would not be pretty because you'd have to take it of the whole thing. You couldn't just take the square root of x squared and of 4 separately. It doesn't work that way. So we end up with x squared equals 40. And so now I know in order to get the x by itself, I have to take the square root of both sides. And that's where things get a little bit messy here, right? We got x equals plus or minus, well, root 40. What do we do when we hit this situation? We leave our answer in simplified radical form. Because there is no whole number answer for the square root of 40. So I'm going to simplify the radical. So what's the biggest perfect square that goes into 40? 4. So that's actually, I'm going to write out the whole process here just to remind you how we do that. So it becomes root 4 times root 10, which is 2 root 10. This is what I'm actually looking for then as a final answer. x equals plus or minus 2 root 10. Or in other words, 2 root 10 and negative 2 root 10. Now two more odd situations and what do we do when this happens kind of things. Alright, so we do all the work and we get down to this point and now this is where the trickiness comes in for this one. How do we deal with what we're seeing? <coughs> because I still need to add 2 to both sides. Now, if I have 2 that I'm trying to add to 2 root 2, notice those are not like terms. And in fact, 2 plus 2 root 2 is really about the cleanest way that we can write that. And so that's actually how we can leave our answer, is I'm going to add 2 to both sides. Let's go ahead and clear this out. I add 2 to both sides, and x is going to equal 2, plus or minus is fine there, 2 root 2. Or if you prefer, x equals 2 plus 2 root 2, and x equals 2 minus 2 root 2. That's as good as it gets, because just like if this were 2x, I cannot do 2 plus 2x. I also can't do 2 plus 2 root 2. So that's as good as that answer is going to get. So when you have that radical in there, still simplify the radical, but it might be plus or minus some other number. Okay, go ahead and solve that second one if you haven't yet. All right, now for this last one here, of course we see, okay, well I need to add 10 to both sides, so I add 10 and add 10. And then I need to divide by 9. But notice, 16 divided by 9 is not a pretty number. Now, believe it or not, I'm actually going to make my life easier here by leaving that as a fraction. I'm going to write it as 16 ninths. I'm not going to worry about turning that into a decimal there. So, next step. I need to take the square root of both sides. Now the reason why leaving it with the fraction in there makes our lives easier is because taking the square root of 16 ninths is actually pretty easy. 
because all I have to do is take the square root of the top and the square root of the bottom. What's the square root of 16? And what's the square root of 9? So x equals plus or minus 4 thirds. So when both the top and the bottom are perfect squares like that, it makes it a lot easier if you just leave it as a fraction. Here's the last pair of problems with uh, different nuances for us to be able to see and address. Go ahead and solve through both of those. Alright, so we subtract 9 from both sides in that first one. We end up with negative 4 equals x squared, and then we have a problem. Because what is the square root of negative 4? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't exist. Uh, we cannot take the square root of a negative. Because anytime you square a number, you get a positive. So, how can we solve this? We can't. The answer does not exist. We'd say there's no solution. That's it. And so then, we say no solution and move on to the second one. Alright, then for the second one, we'll work it through using our normal steps, and yes, zero appears, but you can still operate on it. But then, I have this plus or minus square root of zero. Well, the square root of zero, that does exist. The square root of zero is zero. But zero... And negative zero doesn't really make sense. Negative zero doesn't exist. They're both just zero. So in this case, zero equals x plus two. The plus or minus part is irrelevant because it's zero. And then we'd subtract two from both sides. You'd find that x equals negative two. There's only one solution in this particular case. What that tells us is that we happen to be dealing with it crossing through the vertex here. So that's the only situation where it happens to actually have just one answer.